morning, church. You'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I will join you there shortly. After Jesus arose, the apostles returned to Jerusalem. So after his death and his resurrection and spending some time with them, Jesus ascended into heaven and his apostles were left in Jerusalem. And as Peter and John entered into the temple, they saw a cripple there at the gate asking for money. And Peter said, you know, I don't have money to give you, but what I do have, I do give you, arise and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And so the man jumped up and was able to walk. And, you know, when we talk about miracles, that's, that's a powerful one. You know, when we, when we really stop and think about all of the things that just took place, this man who had not walked for 40 years, his atrophied legs being strengthened, his ability, God's miraculously downloading the ability to walk and how that works and how to jump and leap about because that just doesn't come naturally. You have to learn how to do that. But the entire temple complex was blown away by this miracle. And Peter and John began preaching. They began preaching the name of Jesus. They're preaching the name of Jesus in the same building where the leaders decided to crucify him. Let that sink in. And those same men held those same seats. And when they heard that Peter and John were preaching the name, they, when they heard that this miracle had occurred, and they heard that these men were preaching, they brought them in and they put them to the question and they said, in who, how did you do this? How did you do this miracle? In whose name are you teaching? And they said, in the name of Jesus. Well, you can imagine how they took that. They weren't excited about that in the slightest. And so they commanded these men, you must not speak in his name. You must not teach in his name. You must be silent. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eye? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. Imagine this. Two fishermen looking at the high priests. And I say high priests because at that time they passed the high priesthood around between the families. So when Ananias is there, Caiaphas is there, they're all there. And these two untrained men look at them and say, you tell us what's right. To listen to you or to listen to God. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, remember, these men put Jesus to death. After further threats, they let them go. But they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. What would you do? What will you do? When those with power and those authority come to you and tell you to be silent, what will you do? And I would love that, love for that to be an empty question. But unfortunately, church, I am no longer persuaded it is. We live in a society today where Christianity, the mere mention of Christianity, is become hostile and dangerous to those who disagree with it. And in the first century, that was also the case. And Peter and John stood before the men of their church. They stood before these Sadducees and these Pharisees. They stood before the very high priests of Judaism. And they said, we will not stop. But they didn't end there. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And they prayed, God, we're so scared. Please protect us. God, please don't let any harm come to us. That's what they prayed, right, church? Just let us squeak on by. No. They said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and their peoples plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. These are our brothers and sisters in the faith. In the first century, they faced great persecution because of the name of Jesus. And here in the 21st century, Christians are still the most persecuted group around the world. Are we ready, church? Let's look at Luke 18. In Luke 18, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he tells this parable to emphasize the importance of prayer. He wants his disciples to know that they should always pray and not give up. And he told them this parable. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. Why? Why does the world do that? Why does the world refuse the rulers and authorities and powers that be? Why do they oftentimes refuse to grant justice? Why are they so quick to shed blood? Why are they so quick to neglect the poor and those in need? Why does our world do this, church? Let me ask it this other way. Let's think about it from a different perspective for a second. We see this happening on a regular basis as the church, right? We see over and over and over again how the world just continues to go into wickedness. And yet, for some reason, we care what these people think. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed? I, I, I've seen this thing where Christians get really upset and really concerned because the world thinks we're too mean. Oh, you guys are, you Christians are so mean. You tell people things that they shouldn't do. Well, yeah, we tell people things they shouldn't do. That's kind of what we're, we're here to do. We're kind of here to say like, hey, there's a right thing, there's a right way to go, and there's a wrong way to go, and we don't want you to go down the wrong road, we want you to go down the right road. But yet we get all upset, we get all angry, because the world doesn't like what we tell them. The world doesn't like the message. Church, look at their actions. The world wouldn't know the difference between right and wrong if it came up and slapped them in the face. Look at what goes on in our nation today. Imagine for a second, they are passing laws in multiple states across this nation that say, if you refuse to go along with children's delusions, we're going to come in and take your kids. Imagine that for a second. We're actually trying to figure out if it's a good thing to have a woman and a man box in the same competition. Church. Church. Come on. Yeah, that's what I want to see. So let me get this straight. I'm trying to remember that boxer's name. Yeah, do we want to see Mike Tyson? Has any, have, you, you guys, have you guys seen Mike Tyson? Have you seen this man? Have you, have you looked at him? I mean, if there's a man that I would say, this man is like crazy. Like, like this, is, this is the guy. He's not doing this. This is not about, this is not a game to him. He's going to kill you in that ring. So if Mike Tyson comes out and he says, hey, uh, I'm a woman now, he can box with the women? And these are the things our nation is doing. These are the things these people in this world are doing. And they're going to criticize what we have to say? Church, they wouldn't know right and wrong if it slapped them in the face. We cannot fear what these people say. We cannot fear what the world teaches. We cannot be afraid to stand up and speak the truth because their lunacy is going to get people killed. Their lunacy is going to sterilize an entire portion of our population. This is not good. This is evil. And church, we must be prepared to stand up and speak it. So often, the powers that are supposed to be entrusted with justice, 
The pow- Think about this for a second, church. What are the doctors there to do? I worked as a paramedic for a very long time. And when I worked as a paramedic and I brought a patient, where did I take a patient? If I picked up a patient who was sick on the side of the road, I'm not taking them to a dentist. I'm not taking them down the street to Peter Piper. I'm picking them up, putting them in my ambulance, and I'm taking them to a hospital. Why? Because there's a doctor at that hospital. And he's supposed to know how to take care of these people. But now what? We have children who are confused about who they are and what they are, and we take them to the doctor, and what is the doctor more concerned with? Their health? Explain to me how it's a good thing to cut off a 12-year-old's healthy breasts. They've done it over 100,000 times in this country. Just last year alone. How is it healthy to give a 13-year-old girl a hysterectomy? How is that healthy, church? You tell me. I'll be here all week. You come find me and you explain it to me because I'm lost. Just like then as it is today, church, the powers that be, those who are trusted, those who are in positions of power and authority, judges, doctors, lawyers, instead of protecting those who need it the most, they'd rather sell them down the river. Now in this parable, Jesus doesn't explain why this judge does what he does. But apparently it's a common enough occurrence that the people in the first century implicitly understood that their judges were not always working towards justice. And that can be a frustrating thing. And so this widow goes back and goes back and goes back and brings it before the judge over and over and over again. And after refusing over and over and over again, he finally said to himself, even though I don't fear God, Or care what people think. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. So that she won't eventually come out and attack me. Because that's what happens, church, isn't it? You deny justice over and over and over again. We see it trampled in the city street. Where all of us, any common person, any person, any just decent individual can stand there and go, This is a miscarriage of justice. This is wrong. What do you think? Where do you think that ends up? Finally, this judge says, I'm just going to give it to her. Fine. And Jesus says, exactly. Listen to what the unjust judge says. She goes back over and over and over again. I'm finally just going to give her what she wants to get her out of my hair. Now, really think about it. Will not God bring about justice For his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? James is an interesting interesting take on this in James chapter 1. He looks at it and he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face various trials, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Right? And he continues to talk about that for a little bit. But then he says... We need to trust in God. If any of you lacks wisdom, because that's a difficult thing, to consider something, to consider a difficulty, a trial in your life, to consider it pure joy, he's not saying cancer is fun. He's not saying the struggles that we go through on a daily basis is fun. He's not saying these things are good. What he's saying is consider it joy. Have the mind set. That when these come along, you will take joy in them. Why? Because these things are fun? No. But because the end result of these things is greater faith in God. Now that's a hard thing. And if any of you have ever read the book of Job, you understand just how difficult that concept can be. You know the extremes to which this can be taken. But he doesn't end there. James also goes forward and he says, if any of you lacks of wisdom, ask ask of God. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. Why? Because our Father, our Father is so good, there is no shifting shadow in him. He's our Father, he says, of heavenly lights in whom there is no shifting shadow. You see, the, the key to this church, if we're going to go to God, 
and ask him things. We need to understand who he is. We need to understand what he's working towards. We need to understand what he's doing and what his expectations are. Because if we think God doesn't care, if you think God doesn't care about you and the situation you're in, if you think God doesn't care and isn't aware, hyper aware of all of the struggles in your life, if you think God is just up there and he's bored and he's going, well, you know, whatever, it'll all work out, you're wrong. Jesus says, every hair on your head is numbered. Every hair. God is so involved with us, he knows every little facet about you. He knows what your hopes are, he knows what your fears are. He knows what your needs are, he knows what your wants are. He knows all of it. And if we stop and forget how intimately involved our God is in our lives, if we stop and forget that He is working towards our good, if we stop and forget that our God knows better than we do, we will never go to Him in prayer. We will seek to right our own ship. We will seek to carry out justice on our own. Understand, church, that this is the crux of the question, the crux of the biblical story. Are you going to give up yourself and yield yourself to God and do what He says? Or are you going to make these decisions for yourself? For us to go to God in prayer, we have to trust Him. We have to trust that he is going to do the right thing. Even, I didn't say the easy thing. He's not going to give us the easy thing, church. If you don't understand that, you need to go back and read the book of Job. If you don't understand that, you need to go back and read Acts. When Paul and Silas were beaten in Philippi and thrown in the jail, they didn't complain to God, hey, I thought you were going to take care of us. No, instead they sat in prison singing praises to him. The walk of a Christian is very difficult. We are promised that God will never be far from us. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says, I've been given to all authority under heaven and earth. Go and do these things. But then he says at the end, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He says here, we can trust that God will come and bring justice. And church, that's who we need to trust in. Because if you think we're going to get justice from a political party, you're wrong. If you think we're going to get justice from some man or some human, you're wrong. The only one who cares about justice is God. And he can deal with all of these situations appropriately. At the very end of this, in verse 8, he says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So many theologians and teachers want to throw this into end of the world stuff. When Christ comes back at the end of the world. Church, I'm going to tell you right now. Christ comes back all the time. Christ comes back all the time. He comes back and he rides in judgment over nations all the time. It doesn't have to be the end of the world for God to look at a corrupt nation and overthrow it. You don't believe me? Where's the British Empire today? Where's Napoleon's French Empire today? God has not stopped holding the nations accountable when they violate moral law. And there comes a point in time in every nation that he will have to come and hold them accountable. If you don't believe me, go back and read Psalm 2. What does the Hebrew writer say? Sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus is in the process of bringing his kingdom. It's already started. It's already here. But it's ever expanding, church. And we need to look to him and to God to rectify these issues. These issues of evil and wicked judges. Not ourselves. 
So this morning, if you're like me and struggle with the wickedness and the evil that goes on in our nation today, and not just our nation, but all over the world, If you're like me and you struggle because you watch the news and you see what's going on and it hurts you because you see all these poor people taken advantage of and you struggle like me to get on your knees and turn it over to God, I want to encourage you this morning. Or if you're here this morning and you're not sure where you stand with God, we're going to have elders standing up in the back of the room. I'm going to be back there in that prayer room. Whatever your need this morning, if you need to come, I ask that you come as we stand and as we sing.